Well, it's Saturday, and that also happens to be Play With Some Daphnia Day. I've been doing this outside in tubs since about the middle of last year, and I've really been happy with it. I've been making tons of food, it's not expensive, my fish are loving it, so I wanted to share how I've been doing that, the methods that I use to do it. Right now we're looking at a simple 20 gallon pond liner that I've been using for the most part for the last six months or so. But today I'm actually going to show you how I set up a brand new one a little bit larger so that we can see the process all the way from the beginning. There's two things I want to get out of the way right off the bat before we get started with that other tub. The first is, to be specific, I'm culturing Moina, which are in the Daphnia family, they're just one particular variety, and many of the same rules should apply for the other varieties, but just so you know, we're talking about Moina, and there's some specific reasons for that that I'll share a little bit later. The other thing I wanted to say is I am by no means an expert in culturing Daphnia. There are a thousand ways to do it, a thousand different foods you can give them. This is not really a how-to, this is a how I am currently doing it. And my larger point is, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It doesn't seem to be that hard, I haven't had problems with crashing, and it's awesome food. So, I want to try to convince you to give it a try, and I want to show you how easy it was for me to get started. Okay, on to the new tub. So this is a, I think, 38-gallon HDX tub from Home Depot. The container for culturing Daphnia doesn't have to be fancy, so, so this will work just fine. My hope is I can produce more than double the amount of Daphnia I have been by providing myself a little bit more water volume. So the first thing I'm going to do is fill this up with water. And if you look over here on the right, you'll see an odd looking attachment on the end of the garden hose. This is a really cool tool. It is a carbon block attachment for a garden hose, which means I can just turn on the spigot outside and pump out massive amounts of dechlorinated water, which is very important because Daphnia obviously can't tolerate chlorine. They're supposed to be really, really sensitive to it and also to dechlorinator. Now, I'm not sure how sensitive they really are. I can tell you from my experience that a tiny amount of chlorine and a tiny amount of dechlorinator won't kill them. But if you want to be on the safe side, not using dechlorinator as the bulk of your add fresh water solution is, is supposed to be the safe bet. All right, we're full of water. Now, one more thing, I'm doing these outside and there are some temperature ranges that we wanna stay within. So for the last several months, I've actually been heating my outdoor Daphnia tubs just into the 60 degree, maybe 60, 65, not too far below that. So again, from my experience over the last six months, I would say Daphnia and in particular the Moina, they can tolerate and survive a pretty wide range of temperatures. So far to me, that's been, and this is just staying alive, all the way down into the upper 30s, low 40s, and then all the way into the mid 80s at least. They can tolerate that. Now the reproductive rate seems to drop dramatically when the water gets super cold, but right in that 60 to 70 degree range seems fine. And once you get into the 80s, I'm still seeing them reproduce really well, but as far as really hot water, we'll see this summer when it gets to these tubs being 87, 88 degrees, I'll let you know. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put some food in here for the Daphnia. Now this is where a lot of opinions can be inserted. Uh, like I said, there's many foods you can feed to Daphnia. The one I'm using right now is baker's yeast. I've tried a few different things, in particular spirulina powder, and that works just fine. Other people use ground up or powderized fish food. That works. But for right now, I'm just going to show you yeast. And what I really like about it is I can buy these big two pound bags of it for, I don't know, 12, 14 bucks. And that'll last me well, one pound has lasted me six months, so I'm assuming two pounds is probably going to last me a whole year. And that's $12. Compare that to the same amount of brine shrimp, and we're talking hundreds of dollars to produce the same amount of live food for your fish. So this is a really cost-effective way to feed them. Spirulina, too, if you're trying to feed spirulina powder full-time to the Daphnia cultures, that's going to add up, too. I, right now, have found that to be a pretty expensive thing to buy. So I'm sticking with the yeast. I'm cheaping out, but I'm telling you, it works great. Now, when it comes to the food, whatever food you're feeding, an important thing to know about the Daphnia is that they're primarily filter feeders. So if we put in something chunky, it's just going to sink, and the Daphnia aren't going to be able to eat that directly. It might break down and produce a foul, cloudy water that the Daphnia will have happily eat up, but if you're talking, I want to pour in food that they can eat right now, we need to powderize and we need to mix with water. So what I like to do is take my yeast and mix it in a decent amount of water, and then I blend that up in this cheap 
$18 Target mini blender that I got years ago and get that nicely mixed up so there aren't chunks that'll just sink to the bottom or stick around the periphery of the water's edge. Now that we have the food mixed up, we can go ahead and add that to the water and that'll be ready for once we add the Daphnia. One question I think many people are going to have is how much should I be feeding my culture? And it's not exactly an exact science. I don't have any measurements to give you, just some guiding principles. I heard this described really well once and I'll share that with you. They said, you want the water to be cloudy, but not milky. That means that when you're starting out and you're mixing up your food, let's just say you're using yeast like me. When you add it to the main culture, you want that culture to be clouded up, right? So it's not easy to see through, but you don't want it so opaque that you can't see through it. What happens is the water gets viscous, kind of slimy, probably deoxygenated, and the Daphnia will die off. It's something that you have to feel out and play with and kind of get some experience for. You can start off light to be on the safe side and not kill them by overfeeding, but I will tell you, when I said I haven't had any culture crashes, I haven't had any crash from overpopulation. The only time I've lost all of my Daphnia was the first time I ordered some, and it was because I underfed, not overfed. If you do happen to overfeed, again, if we're talking about yeast, what you would see is the water looking really thick and scummy on the surface, and maybe you'll get a lot of bubbles on the top of the water and around the edges. I kind of ride the line where if I feed them a really good feeding, I see a little bit of bubbling on the top of the water, but not very much. If it seems like the water's getting soupy, you've definitely gone too far. And you're not doomed. You can recover from that. You just change some of the water and thin out the yeast and you're going to be fine. Now that the tub is ready with some food, to start off this new culture, I'm just going to take some out of my already existing tub and move them over here. By the way, if you don't have a friend who can give you some Daphnia or another cheap, easy way to get a hold of them, I got mine from Carolina Biological. It's a little expensive to get shipped to you the first time, but once you have them, if you don't kill them, they last forever. All right, that's enough for now. Let's skip forward a couple of weeks and see how the Daphnia have progressed. If we get in close, we can see we've got a nice little population cruising around the surface of the water. And I wouldn't say this is many more than I put in in the first place. It takes a little bit for the population to really start growing, but they're looking healthy. And for the first little while, I'm not going to add more food. I added plenty to get the right free floating particulate concentration that I wanted, and there's not enough Daphne in here to consume it right now. So I'm going to hold off and wait until I see the water clear before I actually add more food. In that time, we're probably going to get a much larger population going. So again, let's skip forward another week or two. Now things are looking a lot better. Unquestionably, we have a lot more Daphne in here than we started with. Early on, a really good place to look for some of the younger, more recently hatched Daphnia is to look around the periphery of your container, look around the edges. You might not have all that many yet just hanging out on the top of the water right in the center of your culture container. On that note, depending on how recently you fed and how much food there still is floating around, you might not always see and get a good indication for how many you actually have. One thing I've noticed is that as the water starts to clear and there's not as much free-floating food, the Daphnia will kind of collect on the edges, and if you look carefully at the sides of the container, you might see that the Daphnia have collected on those walls, and they're kind of picking food off of the edges. That means they're getting hungry. The point is, you might go look at your culture and think that you have a lot less Daphnia than you actually do. A lot of the time, it can look pretty thin if you just look down into the water, but if you feed them, you'll see a very large number of them rise up to the top where they're easy to net out and get a good feel for how many you actually have. But back to the big tub. Here we're another week or so on, and we've got a really healthy, dense population of Daphnia growing in here. And this whole time I haven't been harvesting. I have been holding off because what I'm trying to do is create a base population. What I mean by that is if you put 10 Daphnia in a tub and you give them some food, eventually, given enough time, let's say a month, that 10 Daphnia could turn into 1,000 Daphnia. That's possible. But if you then net out 990 of those Daphnia and you're back to 10, it's going to be another month before you have a bunch you can harvest again. So what I'm going for is more like we have 1,000 Daphnia, I harvest out half of them, and there's 500 left that can be reproducing the whole time. So instead of waiting a month for that population to regenerate, I'm going to be back to that 1,000 Daphnia in a couple of days. That's how you keep this going. But I also find that by continually keeping the population, let's say, suppressed, frequently cutting it in half, 
That's how you avoid ever overpopulating to the point where they crash. You can get to a point where you have such a large population that you just can't keep them all fed, or if you do give them enough food at once to keep them fed, that might kill them. It might mess up the water and they just die off. So instead, I opt for something that's a little slower in growth rate, but always offering me a consistent amount that I can harvest and feed to my fish. That's why I'm setting up a second culture instead of trying to push the one I had already harder and get more population growth out of it. For now, things are looking good, so we can go ahead and harvest some out of here. I can just take my brine shrimp net, do a swoop through the top of the water, and pull up a nice feeding of Daphnia. And here you've seen the essence of it. This is really the process. For now, I'm just going to rinse and repeat. Keep feeding, keep letting the population regenerate, and harvest all along the way to keep the total population at a moderate level. There's a couple last things I want to throw out, just my experiential opinion on. One of those is aeration. This might be a little controversial. Everyone has their own experience, but for me, I actually haven't found any level of aeration to be helpful for keeping a population alive. I've actually found it to be detrimental. Now, there are many people who have had exactly the opposite experience, and if you want to try it, go ahead. But for me, whatever I'm doing with them, if I put any aeration in the water, they tend to not do so well. They don't reproduce as fast, it seems, and I've even almost killed off some populations by aerating. I don't know why, I'm just throwing that out there for you. The other thing is water changes. Now, you don't have to change water in these cultures very often. Daphnia have a really high tolerance for apparently anything but chlorine and dechlorinator. If we're talking about nitrogenous waste, they seem to be fairly impervious to it until it reaches an insanely high concentration. So your water is going to continue to support a culture for quite a while. But I would say if you're feeding consistently, but the population just isn't bouncing back, it just doesn't seem to be growing, it seems instead to be steadily declining and you don't know what to do, I would say an obvious solution would be if a month ago with cleaner water they were growing fine, you're doing the same thing today and now they're not, you probably ought to change some water. If you have a good source of dechlorinated water that won't hypothetically kill off the Daphnia, go ahead and change some water. There's no harm in it. Also, like I said, if you overfeed, change some water. It's fine. I haven't found there to be any downside to every once in a while changing some water. In fact, I've found it to be very beneficial. Before I wrap up, I don't want to forget to tell you a little bit about why I'm choosing to culture Moina instead of one of the other Daphnia varieties. There's two main reasons. The first is their temperature tolerance. They're supposed to be more tolerant of warm water than the others, and I know these tubs are going to get pretty hot in the summer, so to me it seemed like a safer bet. The other reason is that, as far as I know, they're the smallest variety of Daphnia we can get a hold of, and I typically raise smaller fish. And I want to be able to feed the Daphnia to them as either adults or juveniles. And so again, it seemed like a good choice. On that note, I do want to clarify, I don't think that Moina are a perfect replacement for brine shrimp. In fact, I think there's no replacement for brine shrimp in a direct sense, because even Moina, when they're full grown, they're a lot bigger than brine shrimp. So you can try to use some stacked sieves and separate out the tiny Daphnia from the full grown ones, and maybe that'll get you somewhere. But in terms of feeding baby fish, really young ones, you still want to keep some brine shrimp on hand. Okay, so I don't want to give the impression that you can toss your brine shrimp eggs and just switch to Daphnia. No, I don't think so. However, having Daphnia is amazing for juvenile and adult fish. And what it's helped me with is to cut down the amount of brine shrimp I have to hatch every day to feed my fish and still give them what I consider to be an exceptional diet. So there you go. That said, I think that's enough. I hope I didn't overwhelm you with too much detail. This is really easy. I just wanted to say what I know or what I think I know so far and give you a little bit better shot of not just trying and immediately failing at Daphnia and then quitting. Don't give up. Go get some Daphnia. Make some. You'll love it. Your fish will love it. I think it's a great thing. I always forget something. So if I did and it's obvious, let me know. Leave a comment. Ask a question. And if I know, I'll try to answer that for you. Otherwise, thanks as always for watching. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you next time.